Crime, Wine, and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, teacher, leave those chaos kids alone. (laughs) I'm Naomi. Excellent. I'm Amber, and this is Crime, Wine, and Chaos. Hey, we listened to Pink Floyd last night and played with kitties. <laughs> we did. Oh, we played uh, with kittens. Yeah. That was amazing. That was. Good time. Oh, hi, oh, sister. Oh, hi, sister. How Here are you are. today? Good. Good. Just uh, wrapping up my week, anxiously waiting for my do nothing day tomorrow. Do nothing day tomorrow. I love that for you. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a nice uh, steak and baked potato dinner tonight. That's right. That's right. Roll yourself to the couch for a little bit. Watch some cats play. And then then go to bed and wake up tomorrow. Do not disturb. No contact with the whole world and just Mm -hmm. stay in your pajamas and read. Correct. Amazing. Thank you. How about like you? I don't even know who you are, you know? Listen, I have to actually schedule those things because <laughs> otherwise I won't stop, you know? I do know. I do know. I've met you. Um, oh. I'm good. I'm good. You know, things are pretty chill over here right now. So oh, good. good. I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot. What are you drinking? I saw, Thank you for I saw something dark red. It is dark red. It's called Petite Syrah from Michael David Winery. It's really good. Oh, it's got okay. an elephant on the label, like a circus elephant, which okay. I'm not a fan of elephants in the circus. Right. I was going to say that's bad it's news. Like, no, it's like cartoony, like Dumbo. Oh, Dumbo yeah. is a sad movie. <laughs> it's so depressing. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> Marissa and I recently went down this weird rabbit hole of like watching old clips from like Dumbo Circus and Pooh's Corner. Do you remember these weird shows? They were so weird. So they were like live action, right? Like people were in like costumes and stuff. Yes. It was weird. Like so strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of a acid trip or something. I don't know. Uh-huh. You know, kids programming. People have a lot to say about kids programming now, but kids programming then mm-hmm. was like on a whole other planet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Just bizarre. Yeah. Uh sister, mm-hmm. let's just jump let's just jump right in. Let's like okay. no no prompt or circumstance here. Why don't you tell no. me a crime? Tell me a crime okay. story. I'm gonna tell you a crime. I'm gonna tell you about Megan Para. Okay. Okay. We are going to Cottonport, Louisiana. Okay. Already I have like thoughts about Cottonport in Louisiana, I, knowing I what know. I know about cotton in this country and Louisiana I, and the I history know. of those two things. Correct. Well, that doesn't play a role here, but yes, all, all mm-hmm. of that is yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Megan was described as generous and kind, always giving to others. She was a mom and a kindergarten teacher. She was the youngest of three and she was a daddy's girl. Okay. Also a very special kind of person, very special kind of person teaches kindergarten. Yes. Yes. Teaches elementary school period, I think. Right. But like kindergarten specifically, you know? Mm Hmm. Remember how mean our kindergarten teacher was? I don't remember Mrs. King as being mean. Oh God, it's probably just me because I was, I spent the first several years of elementary school struggling and (laughs) feet of my tall. So they were all kind of, I I felt like mean, but they were probably just frustrated with me. I mean, Um, you know, so on the morning of June 28th, 2014, Megan's parents, Steve and Missy uh, Ducat, Ducati, find her lying on her living room floor, having been shot in the head. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Megan was just 29. She was the mom of two boys. The day before, Megan had been in a car accident. She was driving alone on a stretch of road in Cottonport when she suddenly went off the road and hit hit a tree. Okay. 
Her husband, 30-year-old Dustin, called Megan's parents to let them know that she had been in the accident. And Dustin put the two boys in the car and headed to the scene along with Megan's parents. And the responding trooper said that Megan was going around 45 miles per hour and she was wearing her seatbelt and she luckily only had minor injuries, but he noted that there were no skid marks on the street indicating that Megan didn't attempt to apply the brakes, which struck him as odd. Okay. The officer asks Megan um, if she, or the officer asks the parents and the husband if Megan would be trying to harm herself. And both parents said no. Um, And Megan tells her mom that she was just distracted. And she tells her dad that she, did try to hit the brakes and she aimed for the tree to avoid going into the bayou into the water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Like gators. No hard. No, Nope. pass pass on that. Mm -hmm. So Megan was treated for her minor injuries um, at the hospital where her husband, Dustin worked as a nurse. And that night Megan's parents took the two boys and Dustin took Megan home. Okay. So the following morning around 7 a.m., Megan sent her mom a text asking how the boys were doing. And her mom, Missy, said, you know, the boys were up and having breakfast. And as soon as they were done with all that, she would be putting them in the car and headed her way to bring them home. And everything was all good. Um, So about an hour later, Dustin calls Missy and said that Megan was going to take a bath and that he was going out to pick up her prescription um, and that he could swing by and get the boys while he was out. So she's like, okay, great. But when an hour goes by and Dustin still hasn't picked up the kids, Missy and Steve decide to head over to their daughter's house. And the four of them get to Megan's around 10 a.m. And that's where they discover Megan lying on the floor with blood pooling around her head. So sad. Her parents with her two boys. I can't. Mm-mm. Yeah. She was still in like the paper hospital gown and underwear and nothing else. What? Yeah. From the night before. It's all very weird. That doesn't make any sense. Uh uh-uh. uh. It's literally the first thing you do is like take put that on real off clothes. and yes. sh- shower and put on clean clothes. Yes. Who knows what- yeah. Uh huh. So her dad, Steve, calls 911. And Missy calls another family member to come get the boys. Missy is a nurse practitioner. So she gets down next to her daughter um, to try and help her and realizes that she does still have a pulse pulse, and she was barely breathing. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Steve also calls Dustin and tells him that Megan shot herself and he asks Dustin where he is. And Dustin indicates that he is on his way home, that he's almost there. I'm already like super sus on the husband here because at no point did he try to call the in-laws and be like, where are you? I told you I was going to come get the boys. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh-huh. Dustin arrives about 10 minutes after the first officer. And when he gets there, he goes running right into the crime scene, sliding through the blood kicking the gun and he starts trying to assist missy in first aid what? until yes he just is um overly helpful and helpful yes uh-huh okay okay i mean <sighs> okay sorry keep going no okay so she is airlifted to a hospital in lafayette And then officers get to work on processing the scene. They collect the gun, which belonged to Dustin. They collect Dustin's clothes, which are covered in blood from him sliding through the crime scene. They find (laughs) an... I just have this image. (laughs) You know that move that dudes do on the dance floor where they like, they run and then they like hit the floor. Down on the knees. knees. Yeah. yeah, and then see, and mm-hmm. then do maybe even do a little spin down there while they're at it. Sure, like, this is sure. Mm-hmm. What the fuck are we doing? That's kind of how it was described, or like sliding into <laughs> home, you know, after a a home run hitter or whatever. What the fuck? This guy's dumb. 
or mm-hmm. and and or guilty, but okay. Okay. So <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so they're processing all the things and they find a note on the kitchen counter that reads, quote, Dustin, please tell and then the boys' names that I ha- have always loved them with all of my heart and soul. I'm sorry. No. Mm-hmm. No. So the following morning, Megan passes away from her injuries. Her body is sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy and Megan's parents, along with Dustin, are called into the police department to meet with lead detective Christopher Knight. Steve says that Dustin had arrived at the department first and when they got there, he was already coming out of his interview and he raised his hands in victory and said, I'm not a suspect. Who? I, I'm fucking... sorry. He. What? Who does that? I. Wh- mm-hmm. I yeah. don't. I. I literally cannot. I. I cannot conceive. Of any. 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 Any circumstance under which I would. I would leave a police station. Raising my hands in victory and screaming, I'm not a suspect. Like. Uh, yeah, no, that, like, be cool, man. That is be cool. fucking weird. That mm-hmm. is weird fucking behavior. Yep. For sure. Oh, um, yeah. So I'm not a suspect. Then Steve and Missy talk to Detective Knight. And Steve says it wasn't much of an interview. There were very few questions asked of them. And the following day, Detective Knight contacts Steve and says it was Megan's fingerprints on the gun. He says that Dustin's prints were on the gun too, but that wasn't unusual because it was his gun. Steve confirms with Detective Knight that those were the only fingerprints found on the gun. And the detective said, correct, there were no other prints. But Steve would later learn that this wasn't true. And as it turns out, the gun was never tested at all. What? This guy, this detective sucks. I mean, how many times? Remember, it's like, oh, there's the one. There's the one good detective in the state. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. this guy isn't, isn't the one. That ain't, that ain't the one. There are some gems that make an appearance later. And it's okay. Amazing. So three weeks after her death, the medical examiner declared her manner of death to be suicide. Mm -hmm. I. Okay. So Detective Knight closes Megan's case and um, he summarizes her death in a one page report. In his report, he states, quote, Megan Para died by suicide. The end. Okay. And that was chaotic. Bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs> so, Megan was just a few months away from getting her master's degree. She wanted to become a school principal and she was in the middle of planning her sister's baby shower. So, she was like, living a life. She had she had goals. She was she had not goals. She had shit she was doing. Mhm. So, this is not sitting well with her, her family. Her sister was having a baby. She mm-hmm. had two sons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, her dad said that Megan had never shot a gun in her life, and there was no way that she would have done that, knowing that her parents and her two young sons were coming over and would find her that way. Right? Uh-huh. And also, let's be real. Statistically speaking, that is not how women kill themselves. Correct. Pills. That's right. Night-night. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is also why more men die by suicide percentage-wise, because men are more likely to use a gun and therefore are more effective at completing suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, according to Megan's sister, Betsy, Dustin told three different stories to three different people about where he was when Steve called him that morning. (laughs) Of course he did. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Detective Knight never followed up on these conflicting stories 
or the rumors that Dustin was having an affair. What is this? Okay, and I just want to note it here. Megan is beautiful. Dustin, no. Like, <laughs> what are we doing? I, what are look, we doing? Women sell them so short all the fucking time because they're sold a fucking lie of what they're supposed to do with their lives. But aside from that, I want to talk about the the detective who doesn't want to work. Okay, and this is the real issue here. This is the real issue here with so many detectives. Okay, aside from the rampant systemic racism that runs through all police departments, there is also this like absolute epidemic of detectives who do not want to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. here he has a case that he could dig into. There is stuff he could dig into. He could dot some I's and cross some T's. But this guy wants to just wrap it up and call it a day. You know? Like, he does not want to work on this fucking case. Yeah, I don't understand. And we see this all the time. This is not the first or the second or the third time we've had a story that was just like this, where it's like, the reason justice was delayed is because the first detective that got the case was just like, I don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do I don't want to do my job. I just want to get paid and go home. Bye. What would you say you do here? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So agreed. Agree with all of that. It doesn't make any sense. Besides, there's plenty of jobs in this world where you're like deciding to phone it in does not really harm anybody go do one of those right you don't get, go like phone I, it in I, somewhere else like go work yeah. in a call center like what are we doing <laughs> yeah you Literally, can't phone it phone in, in. <laughs> with somebody's murder you can't just be right like, what, what or even fuck? potential murder right like mm-hmm. i don't know i yeah. feel like i've read somewhere that there are places in the world that not the united states where they they treat all death as like a homicide unless it's obviously not or they prove it otherwise correct right yeah uh-huh. it's kind of like you should treat all missing children as kidnapped until you prove that they ran away and not the right. other way around right correct yeah absolutely like, assume the worst hope for the best and then find out the truth yeah assume that you need to preserve this as a crime scene yes assume that you need to start looking for a person right away Yes. Yeah. How many times do we have to learn this lesson? Well, I mean, we don't have to learn this lesson. You mean? I mean, (laughs) anyway. Anyway, I'm sorry. I just no heated right now. You know what's so funny? This was the one that I did, and I was like, "This is going to make Naomi (laughs) so heated. I need to pivot." Like, (laughs) because it was like first recording. Yeah, first recording after you were back from your trip, and I was like, "You know what? Let's be a little bit gentler. I'll save this for next week." (laughs) <laughs> I love you. I love you. You're like, I knew this is going to piss you off. <laughs> as soon as it got into this detective, I was like, oh, that's the wrong road this week. For her. That's, no, we'll circle back. And here we are. Here we are. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. So the autopsy also showed that Megan had bruises on her abdomen and chest area. And so her dad, Steve, is getting more and more frustrated with the lack Wait, of investigation. Are we not positive? That, I mean, we're. We're not positive, though, that those bruises weren't from her car accident, right? Not positive, but also that was a weird thing to have happen, too. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's getting frustrated. And so he turns to the DA's office to get some questions answered. And he learns from DA Riddle that there's no way that a gun could have been fingerprinted in just two days. And they also tell Steve that even when there is a rush for fingerprints, you can expect at least a 14 day wait before you get any results. Yeah, that should take time. mm -hmm. But by this time, the gun was no longer in evidence because Detective Knight had allowed the gun to be returned to Dustin. Mm -hmm. Did the DA have anything to say about this? Yeah, well, the DA ends up being helpful. Oh, interesting. Just not not yet. So, okay. Okay. Um. Steve repeatedly goes to the police station and begs them to investigate and to consider the possibility that Megan did not die by suicide, but he couldn't get anyone to help him. P.S. We have a theme today. Oh, is yours 
like this too? Kind of. Great. Just anger all around. Okay. Yep. Yep. So four months later, Steve is able to convince a local judge that the case needed to be looked at. And that judge assigned commander of criminal investigations, Dan Schwab, to review the case. No, Schaub. Schaub? S-C-H-A-U-B. Schaub? Schaub? Schaub. (laughs) Dan. Good old Dan. Dan. (laughs) <laughs> just Dan <laughs> so Dan starts to work with Steve and he goes over the case and he sees that in looking at the very small case file that were very fucking basic detective 101 things that were not even done by Chris Knight so uh-huh. Dan wanted to look through Megan's cell phone which Dustin had but at the time, Dustin and the boys were living in Steve's home and Steve didn't want to ask for Megan's phone because he didn't want Dustin to know that he was being investigated. Oh, my God. It's another one of those. Yes. Remember when she got the call? That yes. He and he was that, in I, the room with the her. Room. I, it's coming from inside the house. We're talking about like a potential murderer living in your home. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I know. So he's like, I can't do that because then he'll be on to me. So so Dan does what he can with what he has. He talks to the neighbors on either side of Megan and Dustin's residence. And those neighbors were never interbe- interviewed. Uh-huh. Sure. They're like, oh, yeah, no one ever talked to us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first uh-huh. neighbor said that they heard a gunshot around 7 that morning. But the other neighbor said they heard a loud boom around 9. Hmm. The neighbor who said that she heard it around seven couldn't be certain that it was a gunshot. She also said it was just a loud boom, but you know. That's a two hour difference. That's a big difference. That's not like Mm -hmm. a 15 minute difference. And like they just remembered wrong. That's two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So Dan's trying to figure out if Dustin could have been back at the house at this time for the nine o'clock Boom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he claimed to have been at Walmart that morning picking up the prescription. But Detective Knight never pulled surveillance footage from Walmart to verify Dustin's alibi. Right. What Dan does find is Dustin's signature for prescriptions at Walmart at 943 a.m. So the reasonable conclusion was that Dustin was not home at the time of that nine o'clock gunshot. So... Dan released a report citing that his findings were that Megan did, in fact, die of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. How far away was Walmart? I have no idea. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, But Dad Steve still did not accept this. Mm -hmm. So he is given a copy of Dan's report, along with the 115 photos that were taken by investigators the morning that Megan was found. And the pictures are pretty blurry. So Steve contacts officer Dave Blanchard, who was the photographer at the scene that day. And officer Dave still had the originals on his camera. So Steve gets the originals and him and Betsy start going through the photos and her parents, uh, her sister and her dad. Oh, her mm-hmm. sister and her dad. Yeah, they're doing their own investigation. Go dad, Bet- go sis. Mm-hmm. Betsy also takes a deep dive and studies like for hours online about blood spatter pa- blood spatter patterns. Mm-hmm. Because YouTube blood- University. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's how I learned mm-hmm. how to audio edit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because she says it doesn't quite look right. And what she notices as, is that the blood spatter that should have been on the exit wound side was on the entry wound side. And there's no spatter on the exit wound. And according to blood spatter analysis, there is always more blood spatter on the exit wound. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Steve and Betsy believe that Megan was rolled over after she was shot. Oh. Mm -hmm. There's also no blood on the gun, which you would see if it was self-inflicted. Right. Yeah. So... Um, they also believe that the suicide note was written by Dustin. Steve said that Megan never wrote in solid print and that she always wrote in mixed print and script, even sometimes within the same word. Mm-hmm. I do too. So she, you do? 
Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do I? I don't even know what that means. It means it's like half cursive, half not. Oh, yeah. Do you remember? That's because we were of Duval. the generation. Duval. God damn it. Why we were traumatized by Duval. <laughs> yeah. And whenever like, I make... talk to anybody about Duval, they look at me like I'm a crazy person. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Because it they literally a... experimented on like this small section of children at a very specific time in place. I don't even think it was, I mean, I don't even think it was national. It was literally, it might've literally just been like our school. I don't even know, Amber. I, one of these days I'm going to go looking to figure it out. You know what? It was probably fucking Mrs. King. <laughs> it was not Mrs. King. Stop it. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Mrs. King knew the ice cream cone song. Well, I guess that gives her a few points, but not many. Okay. Okay. So, um, there were no photos. Um, okay. So, uh, what was I saying? Fuck, man. Oh, no blood splatter the on the, the gun. No, the way her handwriting, her handwriting. handwriting didn't match. Um, and there were also photos that showed indications of a struggle. There was a wine rack on the floor behind a chair and a guitar on the floor. So Steve takes all of these findings to the DA who agrees with him that it doesn't look like a suicide. But when the DA tries to get the police department to reinvestigate, they refuse. So the DA goes to the coroner who classified Megan's death as a suicide. He wants to get it reclassified as undetermined so that the case can be reopened. And right. he does convince the coroner to reclassify the manner of death. Oh, my God. This is excruciating. Yeah. This is pulling fucking teeth. I know. Oh, I know. It just keeps going. Great. Great. So. The coroner also reviews Detective Knight's one-page investigation, which he calls sloppy and very questionable. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to agree with the coroner on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This coroner was actually, I, don't, I didn't put his name down, but it was Dr. Something. Oh, so, so he was actually like a, a probably a medical doctor. Not, not a baby coroner. Some, yeah. Not a baby coroner and not just mm -hmm. like some guy who ran for coroner because he felt like having public office, but didn't uh -huh. actually know anything about biology or medicine right great right. and then oh in my next paragraph i have his name so i take that back in 2017 an official letter from the coroner was sent to the louisiana state police requesting a review of the case in the letter coroner dr maya indicated that he was informed that there were photographs that were never made available to him like while he was doing his review yes he the needs state, those yeah yeah the state police agreed to look at the case and the state police ultimately determined that there was not enough evidence to overturn the initial findings. I, I, at every step of the fucking way. I, mm -hmm. So at this point, Dustin has moved on. He has remarried. Mm -hmm. And he and his new wife are raising Megan's sons together. Fuck. But Steve is like, fuck that. I'm not giving up. So he has an old high school friend, David Lemoyne, who is a retired FBI agent. And Steve calls him up and asks for his help. Hey, bud, can you do me a solid? I know you have. I know you know yes. people. I know you uh -huh. know people. Come on, man. Help me out. Yes. Mm -hmm. David flies out to Louisiana from Nebraska to meet with Steve. And he gives David everything that he has regarding Megan's case and David spends hours sifting over the photos and he makes the conclusion that Megan was murdered. Uh-huh. So David calls upon a fellow retired FBI agent and friend, Zach Shelton, and the two start working the case together. They even go to the Louisiana State um, Police and they are temporarily sworn in as like eligible to be active detectives. You know, sometimes these especially FBI types, they get, they retire and they don't know what to do with themselves. And they just, they just love getting their teeth back in a case. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So they first interviewed detective Knight, who was now working as an officer in a neighboring town. And Knight says when he got to the scene, he was overwhelmed and he called for backup. He said when a fellow officer and blood spatter expert arrived to help that that officer told him it was clearly a suicide. 
But when they interview this officer, he says not only did that not happen, but he told Knight that the scene was extremely contaminated and that Knight would need to investigate very closely and rule out the possibility of a homicide. This Knight dude. And now he's an officer. He's like a beat cop somewhere else. Like he had to leave because he could not detect. You know? (laughs) He could not detect. (laughs) Oh. This man had no detection. You know what I'm saying? Mm -mm. Then he admits that he never sent the gun for testing. And when the FBI agents ask him why, he says, I have no idea. What? (laughs) What? I just, I I don't know. know. (laughs) I don't know. I I, Uh I, I cannot. Yep. He then says he was young and inexperienced, and he acknowledges that he botched the case, but it certainly was not intentional. Mm -hmm. Then the two agents bring Dustin in to be interviewed for the first time, basically, since his victory walk, you know. Right. Not a suspect. Uh Not a suspect. (laughs) I am not a crook. Um, he says that in the weeks leading up to her death, that she seemed very depressed. He repeatedly denied having anything to do with her death. He admits to having affairs, but says he's certain that Megan didn't know. Mm -hmm. They then interview both neighbors that said they heard gunshots at two separate times. And they learn that the neighbor who claims that they heard the gunshot around nine o'clock isn't certain of what they heard. But the neighbor who said seven o'clock is positive that that is what she heard was a gunshot. Mm -hmm. Okay. By 2020, the two agents are still working hard on the case when COVID hits. And this is when Steve's longtime friend and retired agent David dies from COVID. Oh, no. I know. This poor dad, too, is getting hit after hit after hit with this fucking case. (sighs) So David's brother, Peter was a local attorney and he steps in to finish the work that his brother started. Oh, I know. So Peter and Zach are working together. They get Dustin's clothing from that day. They re-examined their, they had it sent out to be re-examined by a blood spatter expert, Eric Richardson. And um, Dustin remember slid into the crime scene that day. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How could I forget? But when this new expert examines Dustin's shorts and looks very closely, you can see a mist of blood just under the pockets that could only happen from high velocity gunshot. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Which means that Dustin was present when Megan was shot. Yep. On October 13th, 2021, uh, the DA, Riddle, took these new findings to a grand jury. And six minutes after the grand jury had the case, they came back with a second degree murder charge. No, wow. Six minutes. They're like, fuck wow. this guy. The detective on the scene was like, but mm-hmm. six minutes after the jury sees this, they're like, no, this yeah, is this is murder. murder. Guys. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now the DA has to take this nine-year-old case to trial, right? But then uh-huh. March 24th, 2023, just three days before trial was to begin, Dustin's defense attorney called the DA and says that his client would like to take a plea deal. Oh, the defense attorney says that Dustin is willing to plead guilty to negligent homicide, which in the state of uh, Louisiana only carries a sentence of five years. His sentence will be longer or I mean shorter than the investigation. But Megan's parents said they would agree to the plea if Dustin would answer some questions. So on March 26, 2023, Dustin is in court to accept his plea and the DA questions him on the stand and he admits that he did in fact shoot her and it was not suicide. Mm -hmm. On April 20th, 2023, Megan's parents um, petitioned and were granted full custody of both boys. Dustin, unfortunately, was only sentenced to 18 months in prison. What? Did his wife, his current wife, stay with him? Yeah, the very last like footage of him was when he turned himself in for his sentencing and his wife brought him there. So can you imagine thinking no. that you're marrying a, no. a widower? A widow of a, of a suicide. Yeah, and only to find out that, he, no. What no. are we doing? Honey, you also need to raise the bar. What are we doing? 
I hope that she fucking left him. But this is a lesson in how fucking just not feeling like working that day. This is what it can snowball into. Yes. It's like, how did that guy even become a detective? I, oh, my God, sister. I'm still not. I mean, this did not end in a way that made me happy. I'm just. No. That means he's already. It, w- this was in 2023. Like, he'll be out Mark. of prison soon. Mm-hmm. He'll be out of prison in a few months. Yep. And his wife is waiting for him, probably. Wow. Okay. Um, I hope not. Oh, sister. Well, mm-hmm. we're going to. We're going to talk more about shitty cops. Okay. Okay. I'm going to tell you about uh, Teron Evans Jr. Mm -hmm. But in order to talk about Teron, first, I need to start with Garrett Phillips. Does that name mean anything to you? Mm -mm. HBO had a documentary titled Who Killed Garrett Phillips? Have you ever seen it? Mm -mm. I actually watched it quite a few years ago. Um, and it's definitely one of those true crime docs that leaves you certain that the wrong man was targeted by the police for this murder. Hmm. On October 24th, 2011, 12-year-old Garrett Phillips was strangled to death in his home in Potsdam, a small town in upstate New York. Town of Potsdam is in St. Lawrence County. Uh, The two local universities there add what little diversity this otherwise 95% white town has, while Amish buggies occasionally roll through town. There's a river through downtown Potsdam that flows up to Canada, which is only 18 miles away. Garrett's mom, Tandy Cyrus, was a hardworking single parent, a bank manager by day and a bartender by night. She supported Garrett and his younger half-brother, Aaron, on her own. Garrett was active in just about every sport, soccer, lacrosse, basketball, hockey, football, you name it, he did it. So in 2010, Tandy met Oral Nick Hillary. Everyone just called him Nick, who was a black soccer coach that had emigrated from Jamaica with his family when he was a teenager, and he served in the army before pursuing a career in education. The two quickly moved in together, About and a, but about a year later, Tandy and the two boys moved out, and Nick and Tandy split up. Okay. It was a month later that Garrett was murdered while home alone in the apartment Tandy had moved him and his brother to after she split with Nick. Hmm. Tandy told police that the only person she could think of that could have have a problem with her little boy was Nick. In fact, she left the relationship because she didn't like the way Nick was trying to discipline her kids. And she believed that Nick blamed Garrett for their breakup. So police had their prime suspect now and they were going to get Nick for this murder. Mm -hmm. And while they had evidence to suggest the murderer had left the apartment out the bedroom window and had recovered fingerprints there that did not match Nick's, they still ultimately pursued him as their only suspect. Okay. Meanwhile, Tandy had dated another man just prior to her relationship with Nick, John Jones, who was a St. Lawrence County Sheriff's deputy who had also been a suspect but police had not pursued that with anywhere near the intensity that they pursued Nick. Of course not. Right. Nick had a civil suit against the police department in the two years that followed without any arrest. After his deposition, Potsdam police believed he had given testimony that they could use against him at trial for Garrett's murder. This story goes on and on, but suffice to say that Nick was acquitted. The district attorney, Mary Rain, was ultimately voted out of office and had her license to practice law suspended on the grounds of professional misconduct. And Garrett's murderer remains at large in the eyes of many. Misconduct because she pursued Nick as the suspect? Uh, There was something I read about her withholding evidence from the defense, but that was like one piece of a series of things that she did during her time Mm. as a district attorney that led to her suspension of her license and her being voted out. Oh, okay. The documentary is excellent. You should watch it. Okay. Jennifer Baxtron moved to Potsdam around 2012 with her teenage son and immediately experienced the inherent and often overt racism in what many refer to as the far north country of New York State. Jennifer is an activist and an organizer. In August of 2019, after two incidents across the country of racially motivated mass shootings, she organized a march against racism in Potsdam, part of the route walking right by the apartment where Garrett lived and was murdered. She told a local reporter that during Nick Hillary's trial, 
the racial tensions in town reached a new high. Quote, it was scary because during that time, there was a few occasions when I was walking down the street and people would just roll their window down and holler out N-word this and F-word that. Jeez. I could never respond the way I wanted to because I had the kids with me. So that was scary. But then it also affected my son because there's a lot of racism in the school and I had to go down there numerous times because of the N-word being used quite often. I'm not going to lie. It's scary. Just knowing that I live in a place where people hate me because of the color of my skin. I'm a single mom and grandma. It's scary. Jesus fucking Christ. You don't think of New York that way, too. I don't, I've never considered like super upstate New York being, I, I guess I'm very not familiar with, with what the vibe is up there. Yeah. Very white and racist. I mean, having just done this cross, cross country road trip, one of the things that I discovered is that most of this country and every single state that I drove through, I mean, I mean, every single one, even when I went to Philadelphia, everywhere I went, most of this country is rural. Mm hmm. And upstate New York is very rural. Yeah. God. So Jennifer, along with others of the black community of Potsdam and St. Lawrence County, had been pushing for justice for Garrett and Nick, believing wholeheartedly that racism played a huge part in why Nick was the prime suspect to begin with and the reason that Sheriff's Deputy John Jones was never seriously looked at. Mm -hmm. And then on May 25th, 2020, while much of the United States and the world were staying home, learning how to make sourdough starters, gawking at the Tiger King and downloading that silly dance app TikTok to keep themselves entertained. While on lockdown amidst the first global pandemic since 1918, doing their part to flatten the curve. A 46-year-old Black American man named George Floyd was murdered in the street by Derek Chauvin, a 44-year-old white police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Floyd's crime was being accused of making a purchase at a corner store with a counterfeit $20 bill. Twice while Chauvin kneeled on George Floyd's neck, George's face pressed into the concrete. George said, I can't fucking breathe. And he continued to say, I can't breathe. And at one point called out mama. Mm. And bystanders who were prevented by other officers on the scene from stepping in to help also recorded it. And it hit social media and the press and spread like wildfire because we were all sitting around on our phones with nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. We all saw that murder. Mm -hmm. The first protest started in Minneapolis the next day. And within a few days, it was nationwide and international. By mid-June, over 2,000 U.S. cities had demonstrations, protests, rallies, marches, Black Lives Matter, which had started as a hashtag on social media after the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the murder of Black American teenager Trayvon Martin, soon became a nationally recognized movement following demonstrations and protests in the wake of the murder of two more Black American citizens. Michael Brown, who was murdered by police and when accountability failed to materialize for the officer who murdered him, brought out major protests and clashes in the streets with police in Ferguson, Missouri. And Eric Garner in New York City, who was murdered by police for selling Lucy's mm -hmm. single cigarettes on the street corner. So ridiculous. Black Lives Matter as an official organization is still considered a decentralized political and social movement. Its goal is to highlight racism, discrimination and racial inequality experienced by black people and to promote anti-racism. It is primarily focused on police brutality and racially motivated violence against black people. Mm -hmm. While there are specific organizations that label themselves Black Lives Matter, such as the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, the overall movement is a decentralized network with no formal hierarchy. As of 2021, there are about 40 chapters in the United States and Canada. The slogan Black Lives Matter itself has never been trademarked by any group. It was after the global protests in 2020, after George Floyd's murder, that Black Lives Matter became a global mantra. Estimates vary between 15 to 26 million Americans participated in BLM protests that summer, making it one of the largest protest movements in U.S. history. Yeah. And so it was 
that Jennifer Backstrand founded her own chapter of Black Lives Matter in Potsdam, organizing protests in her small town in solidarity with the protests across the U.S. over George Floyd's murder at the hands of police. June 3rd, 2020, Jennifer protested on a street corner alone. Oh. But by the peak of the protest that summer, hundreds of people were marching with her. Good. What's, I'm sorry, this is making me emotional. I'm, I've been connected with Jennifer on TikTok for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I see everything that she posts and what she's been through. And what started with the killing of George Floyd is now very much about holding the Potsdam police, others in local law enforcement in St. Lawrence County accountable. Less than two weeks after Jennifer started Black Lives Matter in Potsdam, she called up her 26-year-old son, Teron Evans Jr. She told him what she was up to, and he was all about moving up to Potsdam to protest with his mom. Awesome. And he came and showed up with her all summer, all over St. Lawrence County. That summer, there were multiple Back the Blue rallies, white citizens in Potsdam showing support for their police department. And the local BLM BLM counter protesters, they protested hard. And in the midst of all this, a rise in hate crimes also occurred. A couple weeks after the protest started, a cross burning on someone's front lawn in Lisbon, which is in St. Lawrence County. Although a county spokesperson said they did not believe it was a biased related incident. The fuck ever. Investigating themselves. Investigating themselves. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Although uh, some kids on a playground in Plattsburgh, another town in St. Lawrence, found the N-word written across the back of a slide. And in Messina, a noose was found outside the home of a black family. Graffiti under a train trestle in Saranac Lake said, go back to Africa. I fucking. Uh Uh-huh. So tensions were high in North Country that summer. That September of 2020, Teron met and started dating Crystal Kip Hamilton. Within about a month in October, they broke up because Crystal threatened to kill Teron. Um, That was the same month that Jennifer met with the St. Lawrence County DA to try to persuade him to refer Garrett Phillips's case to the attorney general to be investigated. Because you got to remember, at this point, a lot of people are convinced that Nick was innocent. Mm hmm. And was only pursued as a suspect because he was one of the handful of black people in the town. Right. And that Garrett Phillips murderer was never found and caught and brought to justice. That this poor 12 year old little boy was still not like his, his murder was not solved. Mm. Teron and Crystal were apparently on and off again for the rest of that year. On January 8th, 2021, 911 was called to the home of Crystal Hamilton at 6.50 a.m., reporting that a 26-year-old male at the residence was possibly deceased. According to the police report, two officers responded to the call and were met at the door by Brian Gates, who they identified as Crystal's son. So Crystal was like 41 and Brian was like 22. Okay. Gates took the police to his mom's bedroom where they found Crystal doing chest compressions on Tehran. She moved away from the bed to allow the officers to step in. One officer checked for a pulse and did not find one, although Tehran was still warm to the touch. They administered Narcan and CPR for about a minute until a member of rescue arrived, EMT, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they moved Tehran from the bed to the floor to continue chest compressions until the EMT could set up the CPR machine. While the EMT worked to try to revive Tehran, the officers went out to the living room to speak with Crystal. She stated that she went to bed alone around 1030 p.m. while Tehran stayed up watching TV in the living room. Crystal claimed she never heard Tehran come to bed, but she woke up around 6.30, 6.45 a.m. and found Tehran laying next to her in bed unresponsive. She went on to state that Tehran had been having mental health issues lately and she believed he had overdosed. In a later interview, Crystal would tell police that she and Tehran both had prescriptions for Wellbutrin and that she had found two empty bottles of Wellbutrin next to the bed. Okay. Jennifer was... Well, I can't even imagine the depth of that grief, the mother's loss of a child. But also, she did not believe that Tehran overdosed and definitely not on purpose. Right. For one thing, while the coroner ruled it 
a suicide by overdose of Wellbutrin. There was no pill residue found around his mouth, no Wellbutrin found in his stomach, and his toxicology report did not reflect a deadly dose of Wellbutrin in his system. What the fuck? Then how are they ruling it an overdose? Mm -hmm. Okay. God damn it. I told you. Mm -hmm. We were on a Mm-hmm. Yep. We do this sometimes, you guys. Well, you know, we do this. We, we Okay. Additionally, he had no signs of vomiting, and Crystal claimed to have slept through all of this when vomiting and seizures are known symptoms of Wellbutrin poisoning. Oh, okay. So Jennifer put in all the FOIA requests to get as much information as she could about what happened to Tehran because none of it made any sense to her. And that's when she found out that Crystal and her son Brian were both police informants for the Potsdam Police Department. What the fuck? Uh-huh. Whoa. Jennifer's request for body cam footage from the three officers that had been on the scene resulted in Potsdam Police turning over two minutes in total of body cam footage from one of the police officers. In that footage, the CPR the police officers give was questionable at best. Mm-hmm. And then Jennifer found a file that had been opened on Tehran's case by someone at the police department the night before the call came in about the overdose. That's sus. Yes, it is sus. At this point, Jennifer has dedicated her life for the last three plus years to seeking justice for what she is certain was the murder of her son, Teron Evans Jr., as retaliation and a way to shut her up from protesting and calling out the rampant racism and corruption in Potsdam, their police department, and the entire St. Lawrence County legal system. Yeah. Fuck. Jennifer has multiple TikTok accounts where she shares all of this information every day. I will drop those in the show notes so anyone listening here can go and follow her there and stay up to date on the story. She's trying to get someone with more resources and power than herself to seriously look into all of these things, including reopening Tehran's case to determine the actual truth of what happened to him. She's mm-hmm. been trying to get someone to help fund and support her in conducting a new independent autopsy on Tehran. I mean, at this point, she wants the FBI to just raid the DEA's office for St. Lawrence County because the corruption goes all the way up the chain. Right. And I'm like giving you guys the Cliff Notes version. Like Jennifer sent me a a Dropbox folder and a ton of news articles. And like, I mean, everything that she could get her hands on documentation wise, like I have like combed through and it's so much. And there were other like cases of, you know, like, um, uh, people of color in, in Potsdam and St. Lawrence County who were whose cases were not taken seriously, whose cases were not brought to justice properly. Like there's like layer upon layer of like Potsdam, St. Lawrence County, the DA, the attorney general, like all of them are just mm-hmm. they just don't give a shit. Wow. Yeah. And it's like Jennifer's like screaming into the void at this point. Jennifer has a link tree in her TikTok bio, and I'll also link that, her link tree link in the show notes. And you can find petitions to sign to support her, flyers about uh, and and, and um, info about upcoming actions. She often has action requests. There's a GoFundMe campaign that she started to raise the money so she can f- have further investigations done and also obtain counsel to help her keep fighting for justice for Tehran. All the officials info are in there that you can and should be contacting and hounding them into looking into all of this and uh, just a bunch of the documentation that she's pulled together. It's like all laid out in her link tree. So um, okay. that is the story of Teron Evans Jr. and the tireless efforts of his mom, Jennifer Baxter, to bring justice to his wrongful death. That is fucking awful. I know. <sighs> Sister. Well, this was a double Debbie Downer. I'm sorry. I It's okay. I mean, I just can't imagine, like we've talked about this before because this is not the first time that we've known, we've told, some one of us has told the story of a parent who is just, who literally feels like they're just screaming into the void to get somebody who has any kind of power or influence to just give a shit and like do something for them because their child is dead. Like you, like it's like I can't even imagine. Like you, you don't even get to grieve properly. No, you have to go straight into investigative mode and and fight and, and resources and, and yeah, all of it, it. Yes, it shouldn't be that way. There's people that are literally employed that are supposed to be doing that. Yes, by exactly. Us, the people. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
That's yes, exactly. how it's supposed to work. Yeah. So I really, I really just want to encourage the chaos kids to, you know, get hip to this and, you know, follow along and, and help amplify, you know, Jennifer's voice and, and just get way more eyes on this case. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's just not enough people who know about this case, you know? Mm-hmm. I do know. All right. Well, I'll sign that petition. Hell yeah. I'm in. All right. Uh, well, sister, we did it. Yay. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> I don't even know. God. Um, we're on all the things. We're on all the things. Well, you know, we're we're talking about not being on all the things soon. So uh yeah. you know what? Crime wine and chaos dot com. That's that's mm -hmm. where you need to go. Or or you know what? Go join the Chaos Kids Club. Go to the Patreon. Patreon.com backslash crime wine and chaos. Join the club. Uh you can for five dollars a month, you become a Chaos Kids Club member. And you mm -hmm. get a bonus episode every month and you get uh, the new episodes drop a day early for you. We do occasionally virtual wine night, which I'm not sure when this episode is going to drop. We might have already done the next one by the time this episode drops. We but, will have. Yeah. Uh, that all that said, you can sign up for our Patreon just to be in the know on everything that we post there. And then you can see everything we post there. And we've been talking about probably moving a lot of our extra posting stuff, the things that we do on all these other platforms. We've been talking about moving it over to Patreon, which yeah. by the time this episode drops, we might have already done that by now because we kind of right. want to like give the double middle finger to Meta, especially because like, fuck those guys. And yeah, so we're, we might not be on Facebook or Instagram by the time you hear this episode. Correct. Correct. Also, you know what? Go give us a rating wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps people find us. The better, the more ratings we have, the the more likely we are to show up, show up in people's searches. We got a we got another little review on Apple Podcasts that I I saw the other day, and it was very sweet, and it makes me very happy. We love that. So you can write yeah. us a little review if you have a an Apple uh, product. And um, I think that's everything. That's it. Yeah, uh, crime wine and chaos at gmail dot com if you want to chat at us. Um, yeah, yeah. We're yes. very responsive. We love it. We, we love a good email. Actually, mm -hmm. we love an email, a bad email. A bad email is fine. Send us whatever. Amber reads the love letters. I read the hate mail. It all goes to crime one and chaos at gmail.com. Sister. Yeah. Sister. That was so, so chaotic. Fucking chaotic. Goodbye. Oh my God. Bye. Bye. Crime, Wine, and Chaos is produced by 8th Direction Records. Artwork by Joshua M. Davis. Music by Paul Abner. If you would like to support the show, you can visit our Patreon page at Crime, Wine, and Chaos forward slash Patreon. Cheers! You know that move that dudes do on the dance floor where they like... They run and then they like hit the floor down on the knees. knees. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then mm -hmm. do maybe even do a little spin down there while they're at it. Sure. Like, this is sure. <laughs> <laughs>